Very warm welcome to Christ Church this morning for our service of morning prayer. We're so glad that you've joined us online or wherever you are for this, the sixth Sunday after Pentecost. And our service begins today with our opening hymn, Spread, O Spread Thy Mighty Word. And you'll find the words for that hymn printed in your bulletin. Once again, a very warm welcome for our, or to our service of morning prayer. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Dearly beloved, we've come together in the presence of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, to set forth his praise, to hear his holy word, and to ask for ourselves and on behalf of others, those things that are necessary for our life and for our salvation. And so that we may prepare ourselves in heart and mind to worship him, let us kneel in silence and with penitent and obedient hearts confess our sins, that we may obtain forgiveness by his infinite goodness and mercy. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Our service now continues with these words. Lord, open our lips and our, and our mouth, mouth shall proclaim your praise. Glory, glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Please join me in saying the words of the Jubilate, which is printed in your bulletin. Be joyful in the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness, and come before his presence with a song. Know this, the Lord himself is God. He himself made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. 
Give Give thanks to him and call upon his name. For the Lord is good and his mercy is everlasting and his faithfulness endures from age to age. Our service now continues with our psalm and the lessons. Our psalm today is Psalm 119, verses 105 to 112. Your word is a lantern to my feet and a light upon my path. I have sworn and am determined to keep your righteous judgments. I am deeply troubled. Preserve my life, O Lord, according to your word. Accept, O Lord, the willing tribute of my lips and teach me your judgments. My life is always in my hand. Yet I do not forget your law. The wicked have set a trap for me, but I have not strayed from your commandments. Your decrees are my inheritance forever. Truly, they are the joy of my heart. I have applied my heart to fulfill your statutes forever and to the end. The first lesson is from the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and to deal with sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit, For those who live according to the flesh set their mind on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, indeed it cannot, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, you are in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies, also through his Spirit that dwells in you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Our second lesson is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13. Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there, while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. That is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word. But the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and another thirty. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. There is something undeniably and uniquely awkward about this stage, this particular time of the summer, uh, of what's being called reopening. It has to do with this word condemnation. Condemnation. University of Pennsylvania psychologist Tess Wilkinson Ryan wrote this week in The Atlantic, saying that with more freedom of movement, Americans also have more opportunities to make judgments of others, others who always seem to be doing it wrong. How can people be sitting in in groups chatting at an outdoor bar? Who would take their kid to swim in a public pool? Can you believe he made his three-year-old wear a mask? Wilkinson Ryan described it as a psychological morass and I think uh, the, the awkwardness here cannot be uh, overstated, where we are sizing up even good friends as to what their personal attitude towards uh, physical engagements are. Or maybe you're a person that, that finds yourself watching videos of others acting particularly egregious in one direction or the other, and then you, you condemn them, both for their carelessness or for their overzealousness, the the, the Karens of the world. That person is so overcautious, or that person is so undercautious. The truth is, this kind of um, spectatorship, it feels good. It feels good. What feels less good is when we are condemned in return. I mean, as people sort of reemerge into public life, uh, there's a sense of, well, well, Have you made the most of your quarantine time? You know, uh, those kids down the street, they learned a new language, and all my kids learned was, you know, every word to Back to the Future. Everyone else lost weight during quarantine. Why not not you? You know, that couple over there, they redid their mudroom, and you just survived. But this applies to more than just the pandemic. Think about our ongoing discussion on race, this important, urgent, um, and in many ways very painful process of talking about inequalities and the weight that populations have, have, have taken on. In my private conversations with people around this topic, the one of the refrains I hear is, well, I just don't want to say the wrong thing. 
I'm so afraid of talking about it because I don't want to say the wrong thing. The Onion spoofed this memorably with a fake headline recently. White ally willing to do whatever it takes to make sure people won't be mad at him. Have I said enough? Have I said too much? When, when it comes to the headlines, to the protests, to, uh, I wish I had a nickel for every time I've heard that phrase, you're damned if you do, and you're damned if you don't. You add our political divisions and acrimony on top of this already very pressured environment and the lack of physical touch, and what you have is a widespread sense of swirling condemnation. It's almost as, it's as thick as the humidity in Virginia. By condemnation, usually I th that's sort of, we think of it as in terms of external condemnation of a criminal. You are condemned to life in prison. But the condemnation here I'm talking about is less dramatic and it's more commonplace. The sense that you are at fault, that you are to blame, that you are not good enough. And it can be a message, or condemnation can be con contained in a tone of voice or the raise of an eyebrow. Of course, we don't need outside voices. We don't need externalities. We condemn ourselves. And some people call this a conscience. But uh, there's, there is always this e yawning gap that Josh Bascom talked about last week between who we would like to be or who we know we should be and who we actually are. It's not neutral. It's painful. It's heavy. It hurts. It alienates. The way that our Book of Common Prayer puts it is that we have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. Well, what is the fruit of all this condemnation? Well, I'm, from my vantage point, uh, one of the things I'm seeing is the fruit is, is relational uh, alienation from loved ones. How many couples have I heard who are, who are contemplating separation or divorce? And the, the, there's always some variation of the, the refrain, I feel like I can't do anything right, that I've been pronounced guilty. Or she feels like she can't say anything right. This mutual exchange of condemnation results in impasse and heartache. Now, maybe, maybe that sense of condemnation is, is it, you think that that's the voice of God, that you grew up in a church where that was commonplace. Hopefully not. But maybe you heard it from one of your parents growing up. There's a, there was a great episode of the radio show, This American Life, about a young woman named Rebecca, whose mother died when she was 16. And she, she, her mother was clearly very thoughtful, and she left behind 13 letters to be opened on Rebecca's birthday for the next 13 years. And the letters were these thoughtful missives that were sort of a mix of pep talks and moral instruction and autobiography. But what's interesting is that these letters start out as a mode, a vehicle of encouragement and comfort, and they soon turn into something else. All of a sudden, she's 25, and she's reading a, a, a letter with her mother asking her, are you contemplating a dissertation? You know, she starts to, 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 to push herself to meet these expectations, and one of her mother's dominant themes is that she maintain a strong uh, religious faith. She was a Mormon. Rebecca was to grow up to be a Mormon woman, and by the time, you, you can fill in the blanks, by the time she was a senior in college, she was moving away from the church. And so when she would open these letters, she'd start to feel angry. It would ruin her day because she was so condemned by her mother's, her dear mother's expectations. Do I have to open up this one this year? She said, I felt guilty. If I didn't open it up, I was disappointing her. And if I did open up, I was, uh, I was disappointing her. It's a pretty hard thing for your birthday to be celebrated this way, or have a, a, another bomb lobbed into your life from beyond the grave. She was damned if she did and damned if she didn't. For many of us, then, the question becomes not if we'll disappoint, uh, but who will disappoint. 
Of course, we cling to condemnation, even though we see its fruit, because we want, we see it as a mode of changing a person or a tool to get them to conform. Maybe if we just turn up the volume on the judgments and the shame and the guilt, well, then finally, such and such will give way and I will get what I want or uh, that person will change. And this is the prevailing narrative in our culture. The voices in our discourse are all voices of, um, of condemnation. But what Paul tells us in Romans, he says that it doesn't work. He says that the law, which is condemnation, is weakened by the flesh. And so it cannot deliver us from sin and death. In fact, condemnation as a force is the equivalent of tossing a rock to a drowning person. One of our heroes here, Robert Capon, said so beautifully, but yet so controversially, uh, well, he asked, he said, what has really made a mess of the world? Is it grace, forgiveness, turn the other cheek? Or is it guilt, punishment, vengeance, and retribution? Well, we are very familiar with the latter, and we pine for the former. Well, this morning our pining has an answer, because this morning we hear something different, something definitive. One of Paul's most definitive statements comes in that eighth chapter of Romans when he says, there is is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. My friends, this is the thing we've all been missing. And it is what we find when we looked to Jesus Christ. The one person in the world who is not condemning you. The one person who would have every reason to do so but who would rather be condemned himself than abandon you to your own devices. This Jesus who would rather die than judge you for not being more impressive. You see, the Christian solution to the swirling morass of condemnation is not a higher or purer form of the same, but it's absence. More than that, it's the presence of love. Let me give you an illustration, then I'm finished. My friend Rod Rosenblatt, the theologian, he tells the story of how when he was 16 years old, his father lovingly gave him a car. He was the envy of all of his friends, and so they, he became the center of social life. And then one evening, he and his friends had been drinking. They were 16, and he wrecked the car that his father had bought him. In fact, they were all drunk after the accident, Rod called his dad, and the first thing his dad asked him was, Are you all right? Rod assured him that he was fine, and then he confessed that he was drunk and naturally terrified of how his father or any father, any parent, might respond. Well, later that night, after he made it home, he wept and wept in his father's study. He was embarrassed, he was ashamed, he was guilty. His father sat silently and allowed his son to get it all out, to feel the remorse and the guilt, and to process it emotionally. And at the end of the ordeal, he finally spoke, and when he did, it was a single question. He said, Rod, how about tomorrow we go and get you a new car? Rod now says, and he's pushing 80, and he became a Christian in that moment. God's grace became real to him in that instant, in that blinding sort of road to Damascus moment of forgiveness and mercy. And it planted the seed that produced a hundredfold that we hear about in the parable of the sower, the seed of a lifetime of ministry and other-centered giving and spreading of the grace of God. Indeed, it gave him the freedom to own up to his own shortcomings with hope rather than despair. Well, the point here this morning, as you negotiate the swirling morass of condemnation that is both given and received, both received and given, is to tell you simply that on account of Christ, God has not condemned you. 
On account of Christ, God does not condemn you. And on account of Christ, God will not condemn you. The rest, as they say, is just noise. So how about tomorrow we go and get you a new car? Amen. Our response to the gospel message is one of belief, traditionally summed up in the words of the Apostles' Creed. And you'll find the words to the Apostles' Creed printed in your bulletin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also also with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please join me now in saying the words uh, responsively to suffrages A. Show us your mercy, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. Let your people sing with joy. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world, for only in you can we live in safety. Lord, keep this nation under your care and guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let your way be known upon earth, your saving health among all nations. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and sustain us with your Holy Spirit. Now let us pray the collect for today. O Lord, mercifully receive the prayers of your people who call upon you, and grant that they may know and understand what things they ought to do, and also may have grace and power faithfully to accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our service now continues with the prayers, prayers. With all our heart, with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord, responding to the bidding, Lord, in your mercy, with hear our prayer. Holy Lord, we have set ourselves up as the judges of the world, starting with ourselves, our families, and our neighbors. Our brains constantly scan for things to judge or fear. There is only condemnation in a life of judgment. Fix our eyes on the freedom that Christ died to give us, where you are the only judge, so that we are free to live each day as it comes, and not how we would have it be, and experience each person as your beloved child under your care and guidance, including ourselves. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for Donald, our president, Ralph, our governor, and Nakaya, our mayor, for the leaders of all nations and for all in authority, for every city and every community, and for those who live in them. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the poor and the oppressed, for the unemployed and the destitute, for prisoners and captives, and for all who remember and care for them, for the aged and the infirm and their families, for the widows and orphans, 
and for the sick and suffering, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those who cannot bear to say the word pandemic, and for those who are deeply affected by the illness, bear with us, Lord. Give us your light so that we may know that there is an end to the swirling known as this present moment. Ground us in the knowing that you are found in this present, and your mercies and love are never ending. Be with us, Lord, in our confusion, in our weakness, in our lack of faith, that we may know you now and live with you forever. Our pining has been answered. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Now please join me in saying the words of the general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you in the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, you've given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, to be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you evermore. Amen. Now please enjoy our closing hymn, Fairest Lord Jesus. You'll find the words to that hymn printed in your bulletin.
The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you now and remain with you forever. Amen. And now go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. We'll see you soon. God bless.